A paper came out uh, uh, last week, maybe the week before, from Citibank. I'm going to read you like four sentences from it. It said, who would have thought five years ago that the U.S. would become a net petroleum exporting country, edging out Russia as the world's largest refined petroleum exporter? That the U.S. would be generating more electricity from gas than coal? That German utilities would profit warn with some gas power stations running for less than 10 days a year because solar has stolen peak demand? Or that utilities would be putting on hold conventional generation projects and building renewable capacity in their stead even without sizable subsidies or incentives. The energy market has changed dramatically in recent years, and we believe that this mix is only going to alter more rapidly going forwards. Are we in a new era? Have we really turned the corner? Yes. Great. Andy? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, you know, the era that I described in that song is clearly um, fading, in the sense that there are new norms are coming. Um, as you know, gas was mentioned there, though, gas is still kind of, it's the most, most disruptive thing right now. I mean, Amy, you might think differently about when you look at the gross layout of things. Um, and how that plays out in the future depends largely on whether countries outside the United States and here in the United States, they find better ways to get it out of the ground without leakage and without concerns about water. And th those are really hard hurdles that the Obama administration hasn't really adequately addressed yet. Right. I, I think there's more fundamental issues than that. Uh, so let me back up a couple of steps. Efficiency was almost twice as important as gas last year in displacing U.S. carbon emissions. Uh, last year, the uh, weather-adjusted electricity used to make a dollar of GDP fell 3.4 percent. We've never had anything like that before. Uh, and it's, you know, our, our peak electricity, like our peak gasoline, was in 2007. So a lot has already started turning. It is a turning super tanker. It takes a while, but the, the vectors are pretty clear. Now, <clears throat> frac gas is not cheap, uh, and I'm not talking here about externalities, but about two other things. One is the dry gas is uneconomic at today's prices, so the gas that, that is coming out of fracking is a byproduct of valuable oil. Oil is worth four times as much as gas in the market now. But the number of wells and the number of plays that have oil is rather small, and it depletes faster. So there's a 10 or 15 year oil bubble after which you face the dry gas price, which is unpromising. Uh, and gas prices are volatile, and the more low and stable wellhead prices are, the more volatile the downstream prices become because of petrochemical pivot to gas, LNG exports, and downstream bottlenecking. Now, if you're comparing gas with efficiency renewables, which have no fuel, therefore no fuel price volatility, you need to count the value of the volatility, not just the spot bear commodity price. So that adds two or three or four bucks to the gas price. It makes it even less interesting. And by the way, my own utility in Colorado, Excel, is already buying a lot of wind and solar because it has a lower levelized cost than combined cycle gas power. So. I think, and by the way, there are about eight major risks and uncertainties, you correctly mentioned a couple of them, about fracking that will take about a decade to play out. So if they're all satisfactorily resolved, we will have you know, more, uh, a lower supply curve for gas, longer, flatter, et cetera, than we used to think, and optionality is good, but eight's a pretty big number, so I wouldn't place a big bet on all of them coming in right. And in that case, we won't be unduly disappointed because we weren't going to need that much gas anyway. So there is a really important story here about abundant, stably priced energy for the long term. But the story is less about gas than about its carbon-free competitors that are outpacing and increasingly outcompeting it, namely efficiency of renewables. So the, but the city uh, the excerpt I just read is pretty rosy scenario, and we're still at, uh, if, you just, if you don't include hydropower, we're still at 1% or less than 1% renewables in no, the- five. Five percent? Including hydro. Uh, solar, I guess it was solar, I'm sorry, it was solar. Yeah. One, oh, 1%. just solar. Yeah, yeah, right. So we're five percent. Um, is, that's not re yet a critical mass in terms of, of a tipping point, oh, I guess. So why is the industry so petrified about a 1% competitor? Because of the way it scales. Uh, we used to think you had to take 10 years to build a multi-billion dollar cathedral to make electricity. But in that decade, you can now build each year 
a uh, photovoltaic fab, which each year thereafter will produce enough solar modules to produce each year thereafter as much electricity from that one plant's one year's output as your cathedral would have produced after a decade. So the scaling can be incredibly fast. Yeah. And you know, China just set a 35 gigawatt installed PV goal for 2015. That's five quarters from now, or five to eight quarters from now. And that'll soak up the surplus real fast. Japan has 19 and a half gigawatts of photovoltaics in the already approved pipeline. So the two of them are now a third of the world solar market and, and taking over. So, you know, I, I think uh, the, uh, the, the way that this upends business models is really quite profound. That's why in our electricity innovation lab that RMI has convened the industry around, uh, they've been working out some really interesting new business and revenue and regulatory models, grid integration, grid security, all the hard stuff. And the most interesting part of that is that the Fort Collins Municipal Utility in Colorado, they're about to roll out a bi-directional value tariff where the utility and the customers pay each other the fair value of the services they exchange. Hmm. That's, I think, a nice way forward past net metering, which is a great way to start, but then breaks at scale. What, sorry. Well, I was going to ask you, Andy, and I'm wondering if what, what Amory just described fits what you, you told me the other day, which is that when it comes to energy, we need to be focusing uh, less on goals and more on traits. First of all, explain what that means, and is that part, is yeah. this, this shared value, for example, is that one example of that? Well, I've used that um, way of expressing what we need globally in terms of when you look at communities and individuals, uh, and most of our goals, like under the treaty process, everyone's talking about 80% by 2050. All these numbers come out. But when you look at the realities, um, and you realize there isn't going to be a top-down magic kind of comprehensive binding treaty. And no government's going to mandate something that's going to take The us things away. that will take us in the direction of those goals. Directionality counts more than goals to me. Like, don't talk to me about... People have been punishing me for not saying whether I'm a 350 guy. Is my, is my goal 350 parts per million? As long as we're heading up, don't talk to me about something that's down here. Um, finding ways, traits that you would need in a society to start bending curves. Process, not outcome. Process, not outcome. Otherwise, it takes too long to get there. And yeah. you, you can't wait that long to see if you got there. You need to know if you're heading in the right direction. And most of those goals are, you know, the two degree threshold is... is not set by science so much as by values. In other words, it, we grew out of the European Union, and there lots, there's a long story behind the two-degree threshold. But the idea that, and then, of course, uh, the problem, danger with setting tipping points is once you've passed them, then it's like, okay, we're, we're screwed, so let's just, what do you do then? Let's go party, yeah. Yeah, so, so I mean, what I see is the traits that I focus on are uh, everything from reach, reach is the word for reach out. In other words, empathy, um, sharing information and ideas teach, making sure we're adequately educating our kids. I, I looked at that network system, the grid that was here. I would love to see that in schools. The microgrid we have. Yeah, in the back, yeah. you know, have our visible electricity infrastructure in our schools. One of the great classes that I don't see taught is, let's go look at our furnace today, folks. You know, have the kids go into the boiler room. Have the kids look at the electric bill for their school. So, so teaching uh, that energy matters not in a chiding way, but just like this is how this is us on energy, um, and then you can develop kids who are interested in pursuing these kinds of goals um, as well. And I, I that's think kind of what I mean. another of the changes in our you know, how we think about climate that's coming right at us and overdue is that uh, solving this problem is not really going to require, I think, international agreements so much as it'll be driven by the private sector and civil society and co-evolution spread by military innovation. In other words, run by our effective institutions and running the ineffective ones. You might think about how did China make energy efficiency its top strategic priority for national development in the 11th five-year plan in 2005. It wasn't because a treaty made them do it. It's, there wasn't one. It's because people like Wang Jiabao understood that otherwise China couldn't afford to develop because the supply side would eat, would eat the budget. So it was enlightened economic self-interest, exactly the same that, that we hope to be able to inform in the 13th five-year plan in our reinventing fire collaboration with China. And I mean, but, but they were literally running out of oxygen in China. 
I mean, in the cities, I mean, they literally can't breathe. I mean, so they- Which is another they, imperative. That certainly uh, concentrates the mind wonderfully. Yeah, yeah. I, was just, well, I was just there a couple of days ago. Yeah, I'm, but, but I'm the going point, there in a few the weeks. Point, the point there, Amory, is that, is that there's, a, uh, to overuse it called burning platform, but there's something that they really hear in now, and it affects everybody. Here, we don't have that, and people are all, you know, focused on other things, and, you know, and it's- ah, had but, a, that's, but, but that's exactly the point. We're focused on a lot of different things. We have a lot of different values and priorities. So. I think we need to get over trying to inflict our sense of climate urgency yeah. on people and say, you have to do this because of climate urgency. I was just meeting with a very distinguished filmmaker and his sponsor who want to make a, a, a climate solutions film. And it turned out they wanted to spend the first third or half of it talking about the urgency of the climate problem. And I said, look, skip that stuff, cut to the chase. People are hungry for solutions. I can't said, tell why, you how many. And they said, why would you skip it? I said, well, look, if, if you have an audience member who thinks this is an urgent problem, you don't need to tell them again. They'll be bored and depressed. You can't depress people into action. And if they don't believe it, you'll just annoy them and they won't listen to the other half anyway. So why do all that? Just go for solutions and orient the solutions toward many different motives. You may want to do efficiency or renewables because of national security or because of jobs, or profits, or competitive advantage, or creation care, or public health, or environmental stewardship, or climate protection. It doesn't matter. Uh, let's focus on outcomes, not motives. Not, we don't then need to agree about which outcome is most important. You don't need to like every outcome. One will do, anyone will do. And then we can get on with the stuff we agree ought to be done for whatever reason, respect all our different reasons. No one is automatically the most important, and then the stuff we don't agree about becomes superfluous. Well, this, this has come out really powerfully also in the social science research on these issues. The same body of uh, studies that show um, why we don't get the climate problem, you know, why we literally don't get it, um, show, this is work out of Yale and other places, show that um, the same people who have these fist fights over global warming are in sync on energy. Um, this, I, I showed these slides that illustrate this powerfully, where back in 2009, this Yale team did a survey where they, 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 had, they split America into six Americas. There's six, six kinds of Americans on global warming. They range from dismissive to alarmed. And those bubbles change, change size over time. But um, so you ask those people questions about global warming or a cap and trade bill. When they asked about the cap and trade bill, 2009, the run up to the big you know, fail, um, even the people who were alarmed about global warming were kind of meh. I don't, my, my son uses this word meh, uh, you know, kind of about cap and trade. But when you switch, when you ask this, the, same quest, the same people questions about energy efficiency or um, even a mandate for a 45 mile an hour, a gallon standard for cars that would cost $1,000 more, you ask that question, and the only people who are not kind of maybe about that are the dismissives. Everybody else is either kind of maybe or, or absolutely yes. And so when you have all that, that potential for agreement on energy wisdom, wise policy on energy, why would you fight perpetual fight over global warming? Yeah, and, and you know, one of the best pieces on that I heard is, um, is from NASCAR. Uh, there's a guy named Mike Lynch who's the head of sustainability for NASCAR, and they have done quite a bit of research on what they call NASCAR Nation. NASCAR, <laughs> as you may well know, is the, is the largest spectator sport in the United States. 100 million States. people. And it's an incredible amount, and they have done a lot of work on sustainability, and it turns out that NASCAR Nation is extremely pro-renewables. Why? Because about a third of them are in the building trades. They're carpenters, they're plumbers, yeah. they're <clears throat> electricians, and it's jobs. That's interesting. They see it as jobs. And we haven't framed this very well in, in that regard. Um, well, unfortunately, so, so much of the dynamic in the environmental movement growing out of the 20th century was still focused on the beltway, on the next piece of legislation. So when you focus on this as a legislative strategy, you end up with this being just like we just saw the last 48 hours. It's all partisanship and pointing fingers about climate denial and stuff. Unfortunately, that's why there isn't this sort of logic often to these yeah, uh, situations. But fortunately, we don't actually need acts of Congress to do everything we need to do about energy because there's $5 trillion of that present value savings on the table. Right, and you've said that, that to solve the energy problem, you said this famously many, many times, that we need to enlarge the problem rather than, uh, and, and integrate it. This, what, what does that mean? What does that look like? 
Well, let's see. The, General Eisenhower reputedly said, his library doesn't think he actually said it, uh, <laughs> that if the problem's too difficult to solve, you need to enlarge it, to push the boundaries out until they embrace what the solution requires, more options, more synergies, more degrees of freedom. So for example, when you integrate transport, buildings, industry, and electricity, the four things that use energy, it is a lot easier to solve the auto and electricity problems together than separately. Uh, and that kind of integration means expanding our boundaries, not only across all four sectors, but to all four kinds, main kinds of innovation. That is not just technology and public policy, but also design the way we combine technologies and strategy, new business models, new competitive strategies. And when you play with a full deck like that with all four kinds of innovation, you get, as we did in Reinventing Fire, uh, an extraordinary expansion of opportunity, especially deeply disruptive business opportunities. Uh, some, a lot of that is, is coming out in, in our discussions at this conference. And uh, I, I think, you know, we, we couldn't find anyone else who had quite done that expand and integrate <laughs> trick, but the results were astounding. Are there any examples anywhere in the world <clears throat> we're starting to see that take shape? Within, uh, you know, I, I think probably Denmark would be the best example, just, and, and some of it's working about Copenhagen. in Germany. You, you know, you see. Oh, not, not, not the conference, but. No, 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 God, no. No, no, no. The country, no. <laughs> no. no, but you, there's uh, systems yeah. thinking is much more how things happen there. Although that's, you know, systems thinking is almost un-American. That's the issue we face, the idea that well, look, I live in the Hudson Valley, and there, for, for 80 years, there's been a regional plan association for New York and the region. Probably some of you were from there. But they, they, they roll out these plans, but every county ends up completely competitive with the other county. No one is thinking regionally and acting regionally. And, and that's just one example of how antithetical that kind of thinking is to American um, but you're right. Copenhagen is a city that works a lot of Wise. Amsterdam is another interesting one. Well, there's no really like like waste Brazil, heat is harvested. Uh, did a lot in that direction. Yeah, but but there's no one place that we can say this is a uh, microcosm of where this is taking shape. All these different four kinds of innovation, all the sort of the technologies. Close. Yeah. Yeah, right. Well, I'm looking for one. Yeah, and a lot of that's happening in Germany. Some of it's happening in places here. I mean, wh why is it that the CEO of SDG&E San Diego? says that within another two or three years, and this was a year ago he said this, uh, his fossil fueled power plants will be turned off on sunny afternoons because solar power is growing so fast there. It's also ground zero for uh, electric vehicles. Everything's converging there at once and it's just going way faster than new business models, new regulatory models. So yeah, we got a lot of work to do fast, but. The same things that give utility executives the heebie-jeebies give venture capitalists sweet dreams. Yeah. And with the kinds of entrepreneurial skill in this room, uh, there is a lot happening real fast. We're doing a lot of experiments in parallel, also between states, between cities. We have a very diverse federal system, so there's a, it's a lab. We try a lot of stuff and see what works. Yeah. And I think what what's really important is to look around and identify, try to identify the um, administrative, financial, legal impediments to having things speed up. So much of this is not about technology. When I talk to young audiences, the people who are not engineering students, students think they don't have a role here, but they, they do so much. And, and this, I'm gonna just divert very briefly into another arena. A couple of years ago, I had a stroke. Um, luck, I wrote about it as my lucky stroke. Just Google for that and you'll find it. And um, I learned all about telemedicine, which was not they didn't have the capacity in the hospital where I was, so they were lollygagging and dragging their feet, and they were about to send me out, even though I was literally in, in the process of having a stroke. They wanted to send me home. And, um, but what I learned about telemedicine is the technology is there. It's like it's Skype on steroids. It's very easy. The best neurologist in the world can be in any emergency room evaluating a patient. Um, and the impediments are all uh, institutional, financial. Medicare doesn't reimburse unless the doctor is at your bedside physically. You know because the old, that was the old concern about fraud. Actually, telemedicine is easier 
to safeguard against things like fraud because it's a record of everything. So, and, and so that made me really cognizant of this reality that the technology is not the problem. It's these softer issues. And so there's, there's great opportunities for innovation. They are solar mosaic. Billy, Billy Parrish, I don't know if he's at this meeting, uh, he, to me, epit epitomizes his life story. So cool. He started out as a blockading student in the hallway in Montreal climate talks. I, I met him in 2005. And now he's running, helping run Mosaic this company called, with, this, yeah. with this new model for how to yeah. facilitate financing for solar. And they have their own impediments of making it national. But, but finding the ways to, once you identify those things, finding what knobs can you tweak that can take down some of those barriers is really important. I'm sure you run up against this all the time. Yeah, and, and let me get back to the notion of, of deeply disruptive business models. One of our folks, uh, Jamie Mandel, published about a month ago a blog saying, gee, there's enough juice in the business models around uh, you know, Solar City, Sunrun, Sunjevity, Sun Edison, uh, where they, they put solar on your roof uh, with no money down and beat your utility bill. There's enough surplus you can ring out in there as the costs come down, uh, especially on balance of system, that you could actually make it not no money down, but cash back to put solar on your roof. What would that do to the adoption rate? Or another one that Dave Moskovitz at RAP just came up with, Regulatory Assistance Project. I got here two uh, plug-in hybrid Prius cars. This one I'll sell you for $20,000, or this one I'll sell you for $10,000, if when it's parked and plugged in, you allow me to do, as an automaker, uh, to do aggregated transactions with whatever utility you're parked in at the time, uh, and uh, I can be a really effective aggregator. It's worth more than 10,000 to me to do that, and I promise not to interfere in any way with your car owning capability and experience. Well, I think a lot of people would take the 10,000 discount uh, because that Id that asset is sitting idle 96 percent of the time, and you don't care. It's just you know let it do other things and earn money. So, so you know you, you'd you'd get a lot more bidirectional cars out that way. So are we in a place now with you know s this scenario that we started off with with city and the and the, the great innovations that are happening, that we just sit back and watch it happen? No. Uh, what do we need to do? You jump in with all four feet. Well, maybe, but is, is, there a, is there a train that we just sort of get on? Going, or is there, is there a huge need to, for new policies, maybe not technologies, although they will, they will by themselves improve, uh, behavioral changes? What, where do we need to be pushing right now? I'd say most of the leadership now is in the private sector, in its co-evolution with civil society, and at the state and municipal level and in the military. And, do you and see it's the definitely not in Congress, the so private don't sector, hold your breath. Big companies, utilities, energy companies, or the, uh, the entrepreneurs? All, all of the above. Okay. One of the fun things about our eLab is that the incumbents and insurgents have a safe place to talk to each other and create value instead of just lobbing grenades. Because there's you know, at least a half dozen ways that incumbents can respond to insurgents. At least four of them are intelligent and mutually profitable. <laughs> Ostrich is not a good one. Blocking is not a good one because it annoys the customers so they drop off faster. Uh, but uh, some of the others are really interesting. Yeah. What do you want to push on, Andy? What, where do we go? What do we do? Well, I, again, um, you know, I grew up a middle child. I blo my blogging style is to kind of work, not to yell and say this is what I think, but to kind of work, listen to everybody and figure out a way forward. So um, uh, in that sense, I look for overlap. And uh, I'll give you one other, one other arena where there's overlap. The Heritage Foundation for, wants to end energy subsidies. Many people I know in the environmental movement, well, some want to end, end, want to end fossil energy uh, subsidies. So there's overlap there. You know? And there are, as I said earlier, there are libertarians who, who love free enterprise and who yeah. want a free enterprise. Uh, so, so Getting rid of the polarization to say where uh, possible is important. Yeah, I mean, I've been on a panel with the chairman of ExxonMobil saying he wants to end all energy subsidies, but they will, of course, disagree about what's the subsidy. So here's oh, a way to find out. Uh, now that Ed Markey's in the Senate, imagine that, uh, let's say, Doug Coplow advises GAO and CBO on a really well informed, broad, nonpartisan study of who's getting what energy subsidies. And then Ed Markey runs the Senate hearing. He has a bunch of sworn energy executives up there. And he says to them, uh, let's see, Mr. Jones, looks like your industry got $11.3 billion from that subsidy last year. Mr. Jones, yours got 
Senator, those aren't subsidies. <laughs> right. Oh, so you wouldn't mind if we took them away, would you? That's how you tell if they're a subsidy. Right. And right. it would be really interesting yeah. to smoke out corporate socialists masquerading as free marketeers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I bet there's a few of those. I like it. Well, um, we're being smoked out, unfortunately. Yeah. This, this, uh, this clock has hit zero, and, and we've barely got going here. Uh, but um, there's, there's, there's so much we can talk about. And, and, but on the other hand, these people have been talking for the last three days, bring, coming together with big companies, insurgents, uh, cities, um, and, and various parts of the corporate world, not just uh, energy and sustainability, but fleets and, and, and facilities and, and all the different pieces. And that's this convergence that we've made happen here. Um, you guys are really, have been showing the way you for almost 40 years, or maybe 40, more than 40. Uh, so your, your famous soft path piece was about 35 years ago, something like that? 1976. Yeah, all right, 37 years ago. And, um, and, and this is really uh, just, I think, a, a just great cap on, on what we've been talking about for the last three days, that the technologies exist, that there's huge behavioral changes, um, and, uh, but we are on a path that's really exciting and, um, and energizing in lots of different ways for those of in this, in this room and, and the communities that we represent. So uh, we've got one more biz piece of business to transact as a conference before we send people back to their, their good homes and, and places. But for now, I just can't thank you both enough for the incredible voices you have in this space, the, the great work that you do, and the, really the leadership that you have uh, paved the way for all of us. So please join me in thanking Andy Revkin and Amory Lovins. Thank you, buddy.